Welcome to EE 380. Uh, this is uh, November 2nd, and uh, our speaker is Ed Zucker, who's uh, going to talk to us about uh, a new company he is putting together called Alfie. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, the CTO of Alfie, but more importantly, I've always been interested in how people communicate using AI and user interface uh, for those purposes. And I've run labs at MIT and CMU on considerate systems, as I call them. And today I'm going to talk as much as about considerate systems and my research as I am probably going to be about Alfie. Um, you see on the left of this screen some of the people that are involved with this company. And our goal is to advance women. Um, I will pay about, you know, just um, a couple seconds. Alfie is a revolutionary app designed for advancing women. It's about career again, deeper connections and belonging, and better communication. So the better communication is mostly uh, what this Alfie Reflect thing that I'm so uh, excited about uh, is about. And we use Alfie, we use um, AI throughout the system to recommend things and to help people um, improve their understanding of who they are and what, what they um, are learning and what they can do. You see here on the right hand side, a kind of a uh, an image of, of, of a kind of a report card that it gives you. It's not my favorite, but it's one of the things that we uh, do within Alfie to help people understand uh, how they are how they are um, announcing themselves. Um, I'm going to start with um, this. This talk has these uh, five parts, uh, and I'm going to start with AI can help human uh, interaction. So AI uh, can help humans communicate. Um, if you look at what AI has been helping uh, over the last um, while, it has been successful in various regards, uh, although for a long time people believed it wasn't going to be reliable um, or, or predictable at interacting with people. In the 80s, it helped with investment opportunities and made people very rich, uh, people like uh, D.E. Shaw, who is a PhD student here. Um, uh, online searches in the 1990s became a huge uh, use of, of AI, e-commerce in the 2000s, and car safety um, began using it in many ways, everything from, from representation uh, and modeling of people's braking uh, in, in ABS to, to other things as well. Uh, in fact, 10% of car, car fatalities come from di driver technology overload. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, this is, this is you know, there's books written about it, and, and in fact, um, my student, uh, Raul Rajan at, at Carnegie Mellon, um, <clears throat> wrote a paper with me where we actually were able to use a very, uh, we tried 13 different biometrics and found one that could um, discover uh, using, it's a, it's a camera-based one, uh, whether you're stressed fast enough that we were able to get people to stop uh, making um, errors and in fact avoid crashes in our simulator um, or driving simulators. So AI can help in that way. Uh, if you notice the difference between that and uh, the way that the autonomous vehicle direction has gone, my stuff tends to be about helping advance people as opposed to uh, replacing them. Uh, you know, if you you know give a person a fish, they fish tonight. If you teach a person how to fish, they fish for their life. Um, and I think in, in general, there's an awful lot of um, issues. There's a lot of value in simplifying our life by doing things for us, but there's also some value in learning. Um, and here we are at Stanford. So um, technology and disruption and frustrations have been part of many, many meetings. Um, and uh, one of my systems, Roger That, that we'll hear a little bit more about later, um, it uh, found that if it, uh, if it, if it uh, says Ted Selker has entered the meeting, it actually is a dis disruption for everybody. So uh, we've done some things to think about uh, ways of improving um, how, how communication happens to people when they're interacting. And if you think about a, a meeting, it's actually human-human communication uh, uh, interaction that the computer now is starting to mediate. So that's kind of interesting is how we are moving from human-computer interaction to human-human interaction in our, in our, in our goal goals for, for a lot of a lot of the systems we make. So uh, I, I, I stand here to tell you that automated feedback needs considerate systems. What is a considerate system? Well, a context aware system is one that um, is aware of what you're doing and where you're doing it using sensors and AI modeling. 
Um, and AI modeling uh, includes so many things we can use. I mean, today we use transformers. We used to use neural nets. We still do random forest vec support vector machines, hidden Markov models, common sense rules. Rules are still a big deal. Knowledge representation has been part of um, uh, you know, expert systems. And, and a lot of time people say that stuff isn't cool. I will, I will, I have a lot of examples where uh, simple, uh, simple methods of reasoning um, can be, can be quite helpful. But in any case, my view, my, 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 my position is that um, systems are only helpful uh, uh, to people when they respond in socially appropriate ways. We, we have been living in a world where computers are egocentric and they expect us to understand everything they understand, we never do that with another person. We, we start off by trying to make them feel at ease that we're actually not gonna be um, a pain. <laughs> uh, and so um, this, this idea of, of adding this element of empathy to, to the computer is something that I've been really focused on for, for, for decades. Um, if you look at social contexts in which online tools help people, they have a long and, and illustrious uh, and, and also uh, bad uh, background. Uh, email uh, were faster than letters, but flaming became a problem right off the bat at the very beginning. Flaming is when you uh, are unfiltered and make dramatic statements. Um, Stanford AI Lab, a, a few steps away from here, uh, I built a, a system there where uh, we used um, a common frame buffer where everybody could collaborate and it supported an entire community of researchers working together with, you know, keystrokes inter intertwined. Oh, I think that we now do online is, is, is edit together, happened all the time there. But, <clears throat> but uh, backing off to, you know, what, what happened with this communication? Again, bulletin boards uh, without monitors go dramatic. Just to give you an example, I was in the room when the CEO of IBM, a guy named Lou Gerstner, was being shown for the first time a bulletin board. <laughs> and he typed in, hi, I'm Lou. And what came back was, hey, Lou, want to screw? And uh, he said, oh, yeah, I knew they would be like that, uh, which was, you know, sad because they aren't only like that. But people want to be noticed. They want to make a presence of themselves and they go dramatic. It isn't just uh, the social media platforms, although they have uh, been accused of bias towards the and making dramatic, uh, dramatic silos. Um, you know, and they use all sorts of efforts. Now, Facebook spends a lot, a lot, a lot of energy trying to, to counter this. In fact, my, I heard through the grapevine, uh, maybe it's not true, that they have 15,000 people trying to monitor uh, Facebook right now. That's pretty crazy. Of course, they also have AI bots doing it too. But, uh, you know, and if you go and you say, well, where, where has the green always represents in this, in this, in these, uh, List, uh, places where things went well. So Schlumberger, long ago, started representing everything about a person, whether they'd taken a course, whether they dug a dug a dug a uh, oil well, whether they you know you know whatever they'd done at Schlumberger, and they used this in an automated way to build teams um, to 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 uh, go off and do some some consulting to build a you know to make a, a oil well or something, and it was so important to them that they. They wouldn't share the software with anybody. So, you know, it's people's experiences helped them. <laughs> it just seems quite natural right now, but when I first ran into this, it was a it was a big fancy thing. Travel role is a is a uh, um, prototype uh, uh, shy ride sharing system that I designed and actually published about, where it it kept track of um, why it would expect that you know I and you Dennis would be okay in the car together. You know, a little bit around when Uber was being formed, and then what was my need and your need that was coincident? So, you know, I want to I want to study French three times a week. It would notice, right? And so, I also want to go to the ball game, and I live close to you. So maybe say, hey, why don't you guys go to the ball game? Find yourself speaking some French. Um, so, a coach was um, a more complicated thing, which which actually is still, believe it or not, sold in what used to be OS2, and what what it is it is it and does is it watches your demonstrated performance and experience and decides how to help you based on that what help to give you um, in a hierarchy of, um, of 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 abilities going from novice to to expert 
And uh, people using it in my experiments uh, produced five times as much code as people that didn't use it, including the same exact um, help infrastructure. So it was choosing, this is, this came, you know, this was done, in my PhD. It was done at a time when people believed that any AI in the user interface was going to be brittle and difficult. In fact, it, com it competed beautifully. Uh, so how did I do that? Well, we can talk a little bit more about that. But uh, Empathy Buddy is a system that uh, weighs heavily on this talk, and I probably shouldn't be going through these in these detail. But it, it, um, it's, it's all about making people aware of how they're, how they believed as a, as a, as a communicator, and uh, happy, sad, surprised, angry, emotions that the psychologists always talk about. We kind of put those up on the screen in pictorial form, and people uh, did a, uh, reflected on the emails they were sending and actually changed them. So as I go, go on, uh, I will just say that Roger That is another communication support system. Considered conference calling system is one. Alfie Recommend is. And these, these last, uh, you know, five or six are all things I've built. But Alfie Reflect is the most pre, uh, comp, uh, current one. And it, um, uh, Alfie Recommend and Alfie Reflect, um, it previews how people, uh, how other people might interpret your contribution and makes you a little bit aware of that. So uh, my, my, I will start my AI can help interactions story by saying that technology is inevitably used for social purposes. Everything people do is about other people. Um, and and uh, I want to move on to we're always social actors. So um, AI can be considered. The question is, when am I doing something? Uh, Am I talking, doing something, or thinking? Uh, timing uh, for requests and response is kind of part of being considered, isn't it? Uh, you don't want to be talking over another person. How? Social rules, rules of engagement, you know, uh, include that, you know, maybe there should be five affirmations for one, one uh, criticism. You know, that's something people have talked about. Anyway, what does listening mean anyway? Um, what? Peripheral. You know, I'm aware that my, my PowerPoint might go down, the door might break, the projector might fall from the ceiling, but that's not what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about these PowerPoint slides in front of me and that peripheral stuff I'm able to keep out of my mind. Unfortunately, with egocentric computing, they, they tend to, as this one did, pop something up that I have to pay attention to, which isn't typically the way people interact with each other unless they absolutely are falling down or something. Uh, why? Appropriate responses are fundamental to social success. So the, there we are. So, in fact, the, the first thing I wanted to talk about in social actors was that when we were communicating with a person, we use, you know, nonverbal behavioral cues like their posture and their height and their gaze and their vocal behavior and their forward posture and their interpersonal distance and gesture and what they're saying. So they start with an intentional stance, they have social actions, and then we recognize the activity with, in this case, text. And then we have uh, intention re re uh, recognition. And finally, we have a rational agent that does something. So that kind of, that kind of circle is, is kind of what happens in a social dynamic. There's a couple of papers uh, that are really nice about that, um, that stuff. Um, and, and in fact, when we want to be considerate, um, we want to uh, inform, uh, and, and in negotiate a relationship. Stephen Pinker talks about that. Uh, considerate systems are, have this appropriate social uh, feedback. And in my case, I want to say what using AI models of social context and user. And the point is to reduce uh, effective load. You aren't going to be uh, as worried about your emotional responses and reactions to each other uh, because the information is pertinent and valuable, thoughtful and caring, uh, receptive and reciprocal not distracting and disruptive and condescending and hostile and manipulative, right? So, okay, so somehow it had jumped, jumped to these two slides before, but this is a huge <laughs> number of examples that I've made over the years to demonstrate some of these ideas and to explore them. And often what I've found in running ex experiments is that um, what I started off as, a, as what is a vision turned out to be a question. Um, so, for example, with Empathy Buddy up at the corner left, um, that funny, ugly face up there was the result of it not 
of people not responding at all very much when it was text that said surprised, angry, happy, sad. But with a picture, people responded very quickly. So the interface and the interaction in that interface is always critical to to um, to part of the to under to going from the the recognition um, and the interpretation to the action, as I was showing in that circle earlier. Um, so, as an example um, of, of uh, reactions uh, expressing intention, here's Andrea Lockhart. She's now a full professor at, um, at, uh, at uh, University of uh, Texas in Austin, and Floyd Mueller is a uh, professor, these are two of my students, um, in Australia. Um, and what they did is they went out with a couple of uh, uh, sensors on them. Um, and one was a GSR, that's galvanic skin response. When you're upset, you sweat. Um, also, you sweat when a car honks a horn or when the cloud goes overhead. So that uh, you see uh, the galvanic skin response going up and down and up and down and up and down while they are filming. There's a video camera and she's filming people around around um, uh, Harvard Square, actually, uh, right at the right at that uh, the red line uh, entrance to the, to the subway. And what we see is that she giggles these four times. And those gigglings correspond to somebody videotaping her, videotaping them, somebody playing uh, drums on a, on a uh, um, you know, on, in the street, et cetera. The point is that those are actual places where she was delighted by what she was videotaping. And so even though it's, it seems like a very blunt uh, um, uh, piece of information, her voice was quite strong at indicating what she was interested in, what she was doing, much more, much better than the biometric that, that people have been playing with at that at that stage, and uh, so that that's that was kind of exciting to me. Um, in trying to um, understand social mistakes, just um, I'll give you an example of this this uh, study up here. We had um, <clears throat> somebody that was dominant. They were this this represents that while there were two people were trying to work out um, a chess. A, a chess situation where there were three three steps from a checkmate and they had to work together to, to solve this problem. Um, this green person was doing all the communicating until we said turn taking. And that statement of turn taking made a precipitous drop in their dominance. And the person that wasn't speaking at all down down here, we had them we said to them. Any thoughts? And they immediately started collaborating at the same level as the person that had been dominant. And this is five minutes. Notice that, yeah, the dominant person gets a little more dominant, but not much. What's shocking to me is how that little intervention, verbal intervention, made a huge change in the, in the, in the relationship between these two people. Um, just to give you an example of, um, of, of that Ted has entered the room. Here, here's here's uh, two alternatives to Ted has entered the the, uh, the meeting. John. So that is a door opening and it's saying John. Notice that the error rate is very similar to Ted has joined the uh, entered the meeting above. Let's take a look at an alternative. This is me leaving the meeting. John. So we literally by saying John as we leave the meeting and John as we enter the meeting we're able able to get half the errors in communications between people, not, not in people knowing whether he was there, but literally the mistakes people made in communicating with each other. So I've done a bunch of this, and some of it is in um, these papers, uh, and more of it has crept into a system I've made called c3.chat. You're welcome to go online and, and try out this video conferencing system. I'm more or less uh, waiting uh, for... for uh, um, to, to have the funding that it needs to go forward. But what it does in the meantime is it does make people aware of who's speaking and improves their ability to communicate, um, uh, you know, gen, gen, uh, over, over um, not having interventions like that. And it uses AI to do that. It has this modeling. Um, another, another example of something I built that was, um, so in this case, what you see is a background is there was a desktop and it had a window open with a spreadsheet and a window open with your email and a window open with text messaging and a window open with 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 an order form and your job was to sit there 
for an hour and a half filling out orders. And you'd sometimes get a text message from somebody um, saying, hey, we've changed, we, you know, we're out of inventory or we've changed the pricing or, or by the way, you know, you, you should take a break now. So some of it was social and some of it was work related. And um, anyway, this, this uh, up here, this box is kind of modeling the, the, the behavior, I mean, detection. And what we did is we would literally take text messages that came in and reorder them by whether they were about the same topic, whether they were about the topic you were, you were, you were operating with in your email or text or whatever window you're in, whether they were um, uh, <clears throat> um, um, uh, more important than the one uh, in front of them. And we would delay them zero to two minutes, okay? 25% uh, performance improvement, like, like that stayed. And we actually, anyway, we, it's, uh, there's a lot of work, work that can be done in this area. It's a very exciting area. Just imagine that if you don't disrupt people when they're doing something important, if it would matter to them, it would. Okay. And, and uh, here is my the empathy buddy that I was talking about. Quite pr proud of the fact that um, in 2019, it got a lasting impact award 20 years after it was uh, published. But um, this is another thing, which is this, weird ransom note and this ransom note email system that we built i say ransom note because it's got this orange and different size fonts and all these bars all over it and all this stuff um it it actually um when people had um this feedback about whether this was somebody important for you to respond to or this was uh some something that was urgent or whether this was uh somebody new People, uh, even though they looked at the same number of emails as a normal email system, they responded more appropriately. And what's especially important from my point of view about this is our, this was, this was a, you know, a little while ago, our machine learning and our modeling wasn't so good. It was a graduate student working on it, whatever. Um, some, of our, some of our machine learning was only 60 to 75% correct. So that means that the indicators in these awful colors wasn't even correct and people still did that. Not only that, but you'd think that, you know, maybe an email you'd want to respond to is green and one, you know, you shouldn't would be orange. Oops, we made the opposite direction. We said the things that are orange are, are urgent. People still did better with it and they still liked it better. So very interesting, lots of opportunity with user interface to take AI results, even when they are not perfect and design fail soft interfaces that improve people's success. Okay, so um, I've done lots of different things with uh, thinking about uh, feedback um, um, and it's really, really, I guess I will just, um, I don't know. I guess I just wanna point out that, um, hmm. okay, I, I'm gonna, there's a couple things that, that well, track point, you guys might know, is the pointing device in IBM's notebooks, the Lenovo's that I designed. And what was interesting about that is that by matching, it has a cognitive model of, of eye movement and handshake. And by matching the abilities of humans, we were able to get a 30% performance improvement over anybody's joysticks before. So that was pretty impressive. Um, but, you know, when we tried to make it learn, the most interesting part about it was that when it was learning to see how fast you could move your finger, the, the hardest thing was not to have it learning about you and you, it learn, you learning about it. So if it changes and you change, those if they get out of phase, you end up with something that's, that's terrible. And one thing that we found out in the, in the uh, 1980s was before the 1980s, all phones had what's called side tone. Side tone is that when you're talking, it puts some of your voice in the earpiece so you can hear that you're talking. Well, for a while, cell phones took that away and people get stressed when they don't have side tone. I believe people get stressed when they don't have side tone in other, in other regards too. I'm relying on you looking at me intently saying, oh my God, I'm not, I'm not completely off base in my, in my way of communicating. I'm not wearing a frog on my head or whatever. But we do find ourselves looking at ourselves in Zoom and staring at our face. Why? Because we want to we want to know we're, we're we're actually succeeding at, especially with Zoom. Who knows? You might disappear um, at communicating with others. Um, the other thing I want to say is that constructive feedback is a very dangerous thing. And and um, I guess I will 
leave you with um, when we were making a, um, a car that was trying to improve your driving by giving you feedback, we had two, no two knobs on the, on the dashboard, one for affirmations and one for criticisms. And when people, uh, when we gave people any criticisms at all, they made more errors driving, any criticisms. And it was funny as they didn't recognize it, yes? I just was wondering, Ted, I, you know, I don't want to interrupt too much, but I see here for, for both Emacs and Gmail, text completion. You, you, you um, spell correction in some cases. Yes. Which, which, is in many, which is in many cases for the person typing. Of course it is. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, so what's interesting here is a guy named George Heidorn in graduate school came up with this whole legibility improvement for writing. And he turned it loose on some, you know, you know, young writers. Not, not you. You're, you're, you're a very professional writer. A lot of professional writers hate these these things, but in fact, they have been the center of a huge industry, Grammarly and so on. Um, and and so, you know, now we have even things like Gmail and um, and and Emacs that do text completion. Um, thank you for the invitation. Right, it's going to add those those words after. Um, I, I, uh, another, another system that, that we all watched was something that would dance on the screen when it thought you needed help. Uh, I didn't, uh, people didn't Bob. like Clippy. Yeah, exactly. And the thing with Bob or Clippy as it became known later was in my mind, it popped up. One of the worst things for an eye is something popping up over there because it makes your eye drag over there. It's a physiological response. Second thing is that it would talk about why it wouldn't talk about how. And so it would tell you why, you know, this, this is used for this purpose because it didn't know quite how to do that. And the third thing about it is that it would take your eye away from your, from whatever text that you were editing, which again was a distraction disruption. So I, I, you know, I kind of was bragging at the time, the same time the coach came out in what was called smart guides. Unfortunately, the uh, clippy got lots more attention because, well, they sell, they sold, you know, maybe, you know, orders of magnitude more. Microsoft uh, product than than we sold uh, OS two, but when 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 I was another thing that I did with um, Coach I talked about a little earlier, which was recognizing your level of expertise and experience, is you see this this cover and you see through and you see this this magnifying glass. That is where Coach is literally um, thinking about graphical syntax on a graphical user interface and helping you step by step through it with. Uh, novice, intermediate, professional, or expert um, a script. And you can go off the script and it changes what it thinks you're going to do. Whatever it has to say, how, you see how barely there. Um, maybe I'll make it bigger. Um, it, it's going to put very close to where you're working. So that that was kind of um, what what it what it did, and I'm still proud of it. Alpha Reflect kind of takes, takes uh, human human communication uh, to another level. Uh, it uses these faces and icon, uh, iconic symbols um, and short texts to, to make you aware of how maybe somebody else will see you. So if you said something like, this is great, it's going to have this smile and it's going to say positive. Okay. So that's, that's just reacting to your, to your speaking. And um, so here we are where so much of this industry has gone about legibility. I'm thinking about tone, sentiment, and semantics. And we had that one saying, this is great. We have, this is a perfect way to think about this. We give a, uh, a, um, a deferent that's, that's, uh, you know, um, we call that deferent. It's a, it's a thank you for this. Um, this is a hot topic, um, is, is a more neutral response. So we're constantly um, deciding whether and how to give you feedback. And when we started building the system, it was kind of thinking, how do we get beyond shame, blame, and complain? We started off by saying, you know, when, when somebody would say something like, women are not inspiring, it'd have this, this grimace. It's a terrible thing to say. And so, then, you know, maybe it's too edgy. Um, very, very, you know, negative. Women are not intelligent. Again, uh, women are not, are, are not haters. It would be happy. That is very uh, complicated to understand. Through 12 rounds of design, of thinking hard about what would be a reasonable feedback, we came up with, well, first we came up with terrible ideas. Like we had this uh, making women and, and, and men equal. We thought we'd put them on a scale. Now we have their heads on a platter. It's a very bad idea. Um, and we've come to things that are much simpler. So um, 
men are dumber is of course a sexist statement. So we have this, this image of women and men together being equal and the word inclusive. Uh, you are too old for that. We really love the idea of, of the sad part about being a kid is they don't give you the good tools till you're 32. And then when you're 53, they take them away again. Uh, so there's, there's, there's a lot of ageism that goes on in this world. And uh, so um, we kind of uh, have this young woman and this old, older person um, uh, holding hands. So, um, you know, are you too old for this job? Choose ability, not age. This is our little commentary. And our pictures of the of the man, the young, the young woman and the old woman holding holding hands. Um, am I making sense? Well, you know, um, that's kind of a not roundabout way. Maybe we should be um, maybe we should be uh, straighter with our text and just say, is this clear? Um, so that's that's those are some some examples of um, of 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 how how it responds. And you know, you can go um, to alfieco.com and you can uh, find out more about it. You can also go to your, um, to, um, to the play, play uh, store or the Apple store and download it for your phone and play with it there. <clears throat> um, and you know, what, where, where this Alfie Reflect comes to play is when you are posting or commenting on some uh, piece of content or um, sending in a text uh, to somebody else in the app. So um, the last thing I'm going to talk about is how we did this with machine learning. And AI's trajectory uh, used to be knowledge-based engineering, uh, um, and we used to talk about knowledge being power. But um, you know, it, 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 it did lots of things in the '80s. You know, it drove factories, made big complex things work. You know, configured uh, our our R2, R3, R, R, R2 configured computers. Um, it, it, it had linguistic models and medical models and logistical models. An example is um, there was this system at SRI um, that wouldn't figure um, where to put uh, things like porta potties and, and you know, tents and things in a, in a, in a bunch of airplanes that are going to fly, fly them into some remote area. And um, they had a simulation that took four or five hours on a big supercomputer to, to configure these 22 airplanes. I guess they call it, a, I don't know, a battalion or something. And, and um, no one used it. And people would just shuffle paper around on a table as a group to decide where they're going to put things in the airplane. Until some friends of ours um, made this rule system that said, hey, you know, you put the heavy things under the under the wings and the and you put the things that are going to slide around where you can tie them down. And 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 you know, if if you're gonna if you're gonna let them come out of the airplane on parachutes, you load them a little differently than if you're gonna have them come off on forklifts. And 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 guess what? In one minute, it's a long time ago, uh, it would configure this whole airplane, all these airplanes, and then then you would interact with it and move some things that you didn't like where they were, and then it would run another another iteration. And immediately um, most of the people doing that kind of work converted to using it. So the user interface with the reasoning system made a system that worked with people and computers working together using AI reasoning and representation. The trouble with that approach we ran into with Psyche. Psyche was this, is a system that's been going for, I don't know, 40 years at this point. It, they have mo a re really great model of the Suez Canal in the Middle East. Um, um, and they have lots and lots of uh, other other things that they've modeled. And the problem is that um, it's, it's done by hand, and there's a problem with consistency. And in fact, even for small models, there are trade-offs in when something is true. And it gets very complicated to have something that's reliable and consistent. And Gödel's theorem says that you can't really do it all. So it, it runs out of power. It gets very complex. and you know, 40 years down the road, Psyche is not the dominant AI system we're using. Um, <clears throat> so did multi-layer networks save us? Absolutely. You know, before we had multi-layer ne uh, neural networks, uh, people thought that maybe we couldn't do a good enough job at learning with uh, neural networks. I actually did my undergraduate thesis and master's thesis to show that I thought it would work, but that's a long time ago. So the thing that's interesting is what do you do to, to, to decide, how do you just throw a bunch of modeling, you know, this, this machine learning at a problem? 
you got a big data set today. That's what we all have. And the fact is, John Lamping, who worked with Greg Hinton and a bunch of other people making the AI systems at Google, says you got to eyeball it first, right? You have to have an intuition. You have to understand the topic area. You have to understand reasoning about it, or you will not be able to design an AI system. And people say, oh, no, 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 he does it really well. Well, most of the people that you have work on image understanding with machine learning did it at another company first, did it at another university first. So the, 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 we really are at a point where we don't quite understand, but we do know that representation matters. It might not be encoded explicitly in our machine language, machine learning things. But um, anyway, that's my little rant about that. But uh, in Alpha Reflect, we've got you know some things to distinguish that surprised us. So you know we 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 started off thinking, oh, sorry. Whenever a person says sorry, we start off with a very simple model. Sorry was was an apology, and apologies are are no good. So um, sorry to bother you versus sorry for your loss. So an apology is not is is not what that is. That is empathy. So we modeled it incorrectly for a while. We we got confused between uh, sex and sexist. We uh, you'd say woman and all, all of a sudden it would think it was sexist. Uh, we thought you know you'd say black and all of a sudden it wouldn't think it would it would be racist, not racial. So this becomes very interesting. And if you look at this huge um, array here, uh, forgive me for not changing views. I just don't want my system to blow up again. Um, <clears throat> what you see here is us thinking about how so many different ratings of these sentences that we put together as our training sets, uh, there were you know, thousands of them now, um, uh, relate to these different, um, different aspects that we're trying to look at. We're looking at racist and sexist and ageist and, and uh, confident and, and happy and sad. And anyway, there's a bunch of them. And, um, and you know, when, you, when, you, when you do stuff like that, <clears throat> you start with training data you do supervised learning. And then you can, you know, you can use adversarial uh, networks too, but um, you know, you got to uh, evaluate the interpretations and the performance and rethink the classification. Let's say we have built the AI system for Alfie four times at least that I, that, I, that I can name, literally changing and upgrading our techniques each time. We started with you know, the, the one shots and we'll, we'll get into it a little bit more, but anyway, after you're reassembling the results, when you have this huge <laughs> bunch of classifiers all over the floor, then what do you use? Use in the bad old days, we used to use blackboards, very proud of blackboards, use them in lots of my AI systems. That is that, that there's, you know, that there's these, uh, these results and they're all vying for, for which one believes more that it's the answer. And that, that's a really great way to go, except that it's kind of a, a single, uh, it's making a single decision. Um, and what we find is very complex blackboards with different different parts to them. And then we end up with Bayesian nets where we can, where, where, that's, where all of these, all of these expert, uh, knowledge experts that come back with, with machine learning results can can fight over which, which state they are in in a network and then what, what the results should be. Well, that's all fine and good, but in fact, um, we can we can actually do do other things, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So we started off with some direct matching. Sorry, uh, sorry, I bothered you. Um, you know, was we found ourselves saying looking for the word sorry. Very not, you know, it worked for a great demo. Um, and then we tried to use other pe people's uh, models, hugging face, spacey, and so on. Um, but they are they're trained for different reasons and different kinds of corpuses and different re, you know points of view about what hate means and what the, all various things that they've trained for mean. Um, and so we found ourselves stumbling a little bit and then we tried to say, okay, we can use these beautiful little little pithy uh, training data sets with one shot learning and it's hard to get nuance. What we found is multi-label learning is a much deeper way of, of looking at the relationships between the training sets as well as as uh, reducing uh, the performance problems that you get by using by outsourcing to other people's um, systems. So we found ourselves owning much more and more and more of the of the um, of the um, of the of the of the machine learning till now it's all all done in house. Um, and yeah, so. So the, the, in the end, 
uh, you know, we have to decide when we're going to respond to a person with considered systems. Do we know enough to comment? Um, you know, are we going to say something affirming, ambiguous, or negative? As I said, negative is a really dangerous thing to do. It's very easy to want to do it. In fact, all of our, uh, our, our responses at the beginning were, you know, were, think were, were very easily kind of, you know, giving people a, a when you say something sexist, why not let a person know that's sexist? Don't say it. Well, actually, I, as you saw, we turned it around and we try to say, be inclusive, right? Um, it's timely and short and simple. So when I made, uh, I taught a class, I taught the AI class here once a long time ago, and, and I had a bunch of people make these help systems. And it was great, we had 60 of them. And the biggest um, value that I learned from that was, it didn't matter how much AI was in it. It mattered if it could respond fast enough for a person to use the information while they were thinking about it. If they had to wait for it, the system worked worse. And so timely is important. Short is important. Uh, and simple is important. Those three things, lessons I keep learning over and over again. Uh, I try to think about things not being distracting, uh, either in visual or auditory ways. Um, and, you know, I think that a lot of uh, the systems we build try to put words in people's mouths. You know, when it completes things for me, it's nice, saves me time, but it's also not very polite for me to put words in your mouth. And I don't know whether it's going to come back and bite us, but it's something that I'm thinking about. And really, the thing that I like to talk about is assistive versus advisory agents. So an advisory agent is one that, <clears throat> that teaches you um, and, and gives you a suggestion. An assistive agent does it for you. Self-driving car versus a car coach that teaches you to, to drive better. Um, and... And um, so, you know, uh, um, yeah, so if you lose subtlety, uh, you know, you can stop people's thinking if you push them too hard in any direction. Uh, it can be just, you know, pushing people too hard or, 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 or telling them something they should say can be dis disturbing, and it makes them feel like they're losing agency. We all spend a lot of our lives hoping that we have enough, well, personal power power to, to be respected by ourselves and others. Um, and then there's this whole idea of side tone. tone. That is realizing that I am actually succeeding at communicating. That those, those are some of the reflective principles that I've come up with. <clears throat> and anyway, um, it's 5.30 and I just wanted to end exactly on time and say that, um, uh, that we've been building this uh, social network, uh, learning, um, learning network to support women. And it probably will care about other people besides women at some point. But also, this idea of communication reflection, I think, is a broader topic than just uh, what we're doing in the app. And um, anybody that's interested, uh, we, I'd be delighted to talk to you about, about uh, ways that this stuff can go forward and be useful um, as, as a technology. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, and I leave you with... Um, the four traits of, of Alfie are optimism, ambition, bravery, and kindness. And uh, that was uh, another thing we thought of is that instead of just having um, a simple uh, yes, no, we wanted to give people a direction, a vector about where, what, what, it, what, what would it mean to, to, to give people feedback that was, that was um, not, not just bad or good, but took you in a different direction. So thank you very much for attending, and I open any questions. We have time for questions. Yes, we do. And if you have a question and you're on the net, you can just unmute yourself and ask the question. Identify who you are. Ah. <laughs> oh, yes. I was going to wait till I see questions. That's all right. Are there other questions out there? Nothing. Nothing. We had. So, so I have two. One's a, a fairly short yes or no, and the other one. Is, is slightly more detailed because so no no seriously I mean I have to drive into Seattle and I have a good time talking about this um, when you when you mentioned women here are you including trans women I'm included but we're all about inclusiveness okay no I mean there's women who do not include trans women as women so I just and there's and yeah, yeah I, I, just want, I, I just want to, I've had lots of people work with yeah. me that that are all, all every every shade of the of the gender. Right. Uh, is, no, is, I, just, yeah. I just wanted to know how you, how you stood on that on that line. It's not a line. It's it's, it's a spectrum. Well, 
I mean, it, from the standpoint of a vote, voting balance, it's not actually. On, on voting? I don't think that anyone no, cares about not, your gender when you're voting. Not in this case, certainly. <laughs> but um, my, my second one, in terms of most of the examples I think you showed uh, have a particular component of what would we would call interest that a lot of people would have. And when I started talking to other people a couple decades back about when Feigenbaum was pushing expert systems. Yes, he was. Uh, the and, fifth generation. And yes, not, not only that too, but I mean, actually, at the, at the last Open Computer Forum, Ed stood up and he apologized for, for expert Oh, that's systems. very interesting. But that's there's probably a question here. Yes, no, the question, <laughs> the question is, is, is this actually, because you are trying, attempting to do basically artificial compassion and you know, some some degree of empathy yes for for the system of both machine and people to somebody who might be helped and i thought that the a good example that need, might need to be painted would be something like um, what we would call social worker so we mm -hmm. have the edd up in sacramento and they have to make a decision how do they know how does a person know whether or not somebody is actually trying to gain the welfare system or not that you, you hear this story and, you know, I get emails all the time, I, you know, where in fact, you know, I, I get the word sorry as an example, you know, medical problems, as an example, injury. And, um, you know. You're, you're a patient or you're really part of EDD? No, not, well, the person. I'm just talking about the emails you're getting. Right, right. E, e, EDD has this person or this problem that they have, but they only have so much personnel yet they have this flood of people, especially during the pandemic, and they have to make, and it, you know, that's at the state level. What, what does EDD stand for? Employment development, okay. you know, and of course at the national level, at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, there was this dispersal of, of money and a fair number of people, not not the majority, certainly, uh, you know, did multi-million dollar scams on, on the federal disbursement of, of funds. But at the same time, at the at the lower level, there were smaller people in in, in real need, and determining what what the availability of the need was, with the, the amount of funds to disperse. How how can you? I mean, do, do you have some things to think? Yeah, about? there's all sorts of questions there. Right. So number one, they're sensing. You have to understand uh, what what you know whether a person's being truthful or not, and whether they are making a good argument or not and whether they are, they actually, their argument actually represents um, a need that is real. So those are three different things that we have to, we have to measure. Um, and uh, we don't have the personnel because we think we can do it a better or simpler way. That's fine. So I don't think that that's actually, I don't, I don't actually, it doesn't bother me that it takes a lot of people to figure out if people have needs. I think it's worth, worth figuring out whether people have needs. But, but in fact, yes, there are things we can do to automate things like that. I think that the part, you know, so there's 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 the parts about measuring it and sensing it and everything like that. But the part that I'm really caring about mostly of my in my career is about the part that people aren't doing, which is how do you how do you even communicate with a computer? How do you communicate with another person using a computer to support you? In every social situation we are in now, there is also a phone. Often there's a phone that's listening for a question even. Uh, do, do you know, do you want to find out when the baseball game starts? I mean, you know, and you just, you know, and it just, and then all of a sudden it'll pop up in the middle of your conversation and say, you know, you know, when it's going to start. Um, the question is whether that's appropriate or not. And I think that uh, we have spent way, way, way too little. We've spent a lot of time thinking, oh, can we do a better job of sensing and, and detecting and being and finding people that are cheating and this and that and that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the field that has, you know, you know, 10 million people working on. The, the one about trying to make people feel more comfortable, work together better, uh, that's not very big at all. And so that's kind of what I'm standing up here saying, I want computers to be um, agentic. I want them to, I mean, to, to work better with people. Uh, uh, and, and, and still, I will say, you know, with regard to your question, which I see why you deserve an answer anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, people, you know, the computers uh, modeling of these, of these conversations is getting better and better. And yet you see, Facebook, who who has to do this for a living or die, um, figure out whether people are truthful or not. They they have you know an army of people and an army of bots. And I think that this collaboration between computers and machines, uh, people, is the most is is the most fun thing we have. We always have been playing with machines and collaborating with 
with each other using, you know, uh, whether it's a saw that has two handles or whatever, um, we're collaborating with another person, and and that will continue. And I want to celebrate that. I want to celebrate the in integration of using computers for what they're good for, and to have them communicate with people in a way that makes people um, succeed better and feel better about themselves and each other. In order to say augmentation. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I, I, no, I'll call it learning. Okay. okay, so the augmentation, you know, is, is Marvin Minsky, one of my dearest, dearest friends until he passed, um, 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 you know, was hoping for, you know, augmentation or replacement. I'm just hoping to have a good life. And it's getting hard because we got supercomputers in our phone, in our, in our pockets that are distracting us enough that we are falling off the Taj Mahal. When the, when the phone knows exactly where we are, there's no reason that phone couldn't have stopped us from falling off the Taj Mahal. Well, we could discuss more of this at dinner if you want. Any questions? No, Anybody I, I, online? Do you have a question? Oh. Well, the, oh no, it is much beyond that. Alfie um, is a um, collect, the, um, basically a you know best-selling author. Julian Guthrie started this company, and she wrote a book called Alpha Girls, and it was about women that did really well. And she, when she goes around giving talks about it, she started recognizing that there was an awful lot of people that didn't get, weren't getting ahead because they had glass ceilings of various sorts. And so she thought, you know, wouldn't it be cool to make an app that would support women advancing? And what she did, because it's her wheelhouse, is she got some of the best writers in the world to write articles, make video tape, videos about like, you know, what's it mean to pivot that's changing the kind of job you're in? What inspirational women, you know, that, that have done things, gone to space, gone down to the bottom of the sea, whatever. And she has articles about them, articles by them, um, videos about them. There's talks that happen several times a week. That are that are supposed to be inspiring. There's a game you can play that that kind of makes you think about a person that's inspiring. There's there's a social network you can create between people to talk about um, to talk about whatever you want to to you know and, uh, relative to advancing your you know feeling better about about your your chances and working towards it. There's even things to help you think about how to get to be, get better jobs. So there's an awful lot. It's it's you know thousands of of pieces of, of of content in it, and there's you know little little lessons. Um, we might call them uh, you know hacks. Um, so it's 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 quite it's quite a robust platform, and I you know I welcome everybody to try it. Um, I was just talking about one little corner of it that's got a lot of attention. This 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 way of of watching a person communicate and improving their communication, and I'm talking about it because you know it's 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 a very direct um, experiential thing. That is that, that works with whatever content you're you're working with. So that's different from the typical stuff, which we we have a lot of in in Alfie. That is stuff that's you know appropriate for for the person that wants to learn about how how women can succeed. And that stuff is 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 and especially interesting to me is that I think that there's very little um, well written stuff about ageism, and that's that's something we focused on. That I think is 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 interesting to to the world, but it's also uh, been been under under people don't know what to do with it, um, and so we're exploring that as well as uh, other things about about um, about 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 these these issues. So no, thank you for that question. Uh, and question. yes, please. So you said that you worked on this experience expertise recognition system, the kind of Baker experience and that you uh, mm, expertise, expertise. Yeah. yeah. Sure. I mean, it could give a per chart, and it could give you a Gantt, uh, you know, and then show you how to do this, and then that, and the other thing. No. What it does is it uses what it what it watches you do. By watching you, it learns your expertise and experience. Yes, you can fill out a profile, but mostly our idea is that we watch what you're interested in, how you interact with it, what comments you make, and then we suggest other content. And there's a for me page, which is a list of all the things we hope 
uh, we've thought through well enough and, and reasoned well enough to know would be useful to you. And so that, that's, that's the idea. Yes, our activity while using this app. Okay, so it's not, it's not just collecting, it's not just swiping up everything about you in the world. You know, it's not scraping, scraping your Facebook. I mean, maybe that'd be interesting, but it'd probably be intrusive. So what we're doing is we're watching what, how you how you interact with our app. You know, yeah. yeah. Is there any more? Okay. So anyhow, any nobody's raised their hand out there. Nobody's raised. They're all busy eating they're dinner. All, they're probably eating, eating dinner or something. But you know, it's always amazing what you get yourself into. Who? You. Oh me. <laughs> But this is this is probably, I think, the most interesting AI talk I've heard in a long time. Oh, thank you so and much. The reason for it is that it's simple and practical, and it'll have a fairly high impact. Well, thank you. I think that it's practical, and I actually believe there's some theoretical uh, underpinnings that that you know will seem easy to us afterwards, but have been coming 50 or 60 or 80 years. Yeah. And and that that's the interesting thing is that this the modeling the pe the people's response is is uh, a worthy task in my view. Yeah, and um, but I think I think it points out something which I've begun to believe, but I'm not really willing to tell anybody else I do. And that is, um, I'm not certain that all of our concern about privacy and, and information is in the long run. A practical choice. Yeah. It seems to me that if we're going to, to collaborate and cuddle up with these machines, and it's going to help us, they have to be able to know a lot of stuff about us. And if we try to keep ourselves private and secret, um, and you don't share it across the little community, uh, you don't get the benefit. Yeah. So I think it's really an interesting topic of what is, where, where is privacy come and go in society? And you think about, you know, maybe maybe you could imagine Adam and Eve sitting around a fire and, and then they want to get some privacy. So they go behind a rock. Right. And they get together. And 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 so then they you know say, hey, wouldn't it be fun if we could do that anytime from any direction? And they build a little hut. Right. And so, so all this sudden they're in the fireplace with everybody else very much. And then then people then they get lonely. Right, and they invite people over to their hut. Pretty soon, the, the the front door is open, and everyone's hanging out in the hut. And so they have to get a cottage next to the river or something. But you know, uh, we we have these things where we like we love having a lawn, and we love being in a you know in a community. And then we put up fences between our yards, and then we find ourselves never getting to play with the kids next door. And I remember going, um, you know, just delivering somebody that had been you know, you know, uh, doing some labor to to a, a community in Mountain View, which had this huge apartment complex and everyone was jammed together and there's a little swimming pool between everybody. And the kids are just running all over the place. All the doors are open, everybody's playing together. And I was thinking, you know, my, my kid was with me. He says, why can I, can I play here? And I said, well, we have to ask, you know, but you probably, and the point being that, you know, there's, there's a lot lost in privacy uh, that you, you know, there's a lot to learn by being with other well, people. Well, I think the part of the problem, unfortunately, is the Caucasian population in the United States. Is that a sexist statement? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's okay. a racist statement. Okay, right. um, is, I mean, I, I grew up in Southern California where we had fences, and one of the first things you learn when you're when you're at least a boy at the time is you learn how to climb a fence. And that's something Steve Crocker at UCLA was noted for very early on on the orphanage, as an example, climb over transoms to get to the Access. But the thing is, I think one of the things that surprised me on my first business trips to the East Coast was the number of communities that really they had, they did not have fences. So your next door neighbor was actually fairly close by and you, know, you, sh you shared certain things in common, but that was not the case in Southern California. Now, Southern California. Well, anyway, I bet we digress. Yeah, but... <laughs> at, the time, at, no, at the time, though, we had more, we had sort of had more space. And when I talk to people about private. Let's see, well, first I, I do kind of ascribe to McNeely's privacy stick, you know, for okay. but I, I'll, I'll play both sides. The people that really, who really understand privacy, actually, if you want to meet people who really know privacy, I, my suggestion is go visit the Hopi Reservation in Arizona. They understand privacy. You know, and one thing you don't do, you don't 
don't take pictures of the Hopi. Okay. Why? Because they think you're stealing their soul. Yeah. They, 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 they really do. And they, they, have a, they have a big point. The problem that we have in our society is, you know, you want to have a, a, a limited controlled space, but then you, at the same time, though, you want to get out your message in order for you to help your economic interests and, and, and the like. And I, I, I face, you know, a lot of people just assume that, hey, I'm an extension of the white race. But when I go to a Native American or First Nations reservation, I, I hear very different yeah. conversations than if I had a Caucasian friend. Sure. I, I mean, you know, race aside, Everybody has this situation I was describing, which is this this tension between whether to share or whether to keep keep to themselves. And you know, in the, in, because we're social animals, eventually people need to be around other people um, for lots of reasons. And and in fact, you know, privacy cannot be complete. And uh, you know, and and yet um, you know, sharing can't be complete. Uh, and I think that those 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 th th those you know, those, those, those are real, real issues. And, you know, I mean, I remember when Google was a one story building and I used to go visit my friends over there, you know, and, and we just, I just walk in the door and it was open and, and, you know, just sit down and hang out and go to and have food. Yeah, and, me, yeah me, me too. I had the same thing, you know, I knew Larry and Sergey in their, sure. in their uh, top ramen phase. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, and, but they can't do that as easily now. No, they, 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 they can't, they have to have bodily security with them. Bill Gates, I don't know. I hope not. No, no, they they do. I definitely know that they have, yeah. to, they have to keep this. They, you know, very similar to the Pelosi. Anyway, yes, I know. Yeah. My suggestion, though, is I think we should probably, unless you have something to add. Oh, yeah. I don't. And, and one, one, more, one more shout out if anybody online has yeah, some. Uh, yeah. I think we should, you know, observe. I think we don't have anyone. Let's, to, this to Let's uh, call this a day. Thank you very much. This is a great talk. Oh, thank you.